Hi everybody. So we are um, now up to chapter 12, section 4, which is about composition of functions. I am going to assume that you've seen composition of functions in some form in, in other courses. And our main job here is to connect what you already know to our fancy set theoretic definition of functions and um, make a few observations about how composition interacts with um, injectivity and surjectivity. So let's start by remembering what composition of functions is. So suppose we have two functions, it, it, f and g, and I'm going to draw a little picture here. So here's the set A, and here's the set B, and here's the set C. And we can think of the function f as giving us a way for each element in A to associate a particular element in B. And we can, so this is F. And we can think of G as similarly giving us a way to associate to every element in B an element in C. Like this. And so the composition of the two functions f and g is a new function which goes all the way from a to c and it's written g circle f and it goes all the way from a to c and the rule for constructing it is you first you take an element in a you first do f and get an element of b and then you apply g and get an element of c so if I was going to draw arrows for the composition from A to C, the arrows that would go from A to Z would A to C would be the arrows that you got by following first an arrow that started at a point in A and then picking up the arrow that starts in B and ends up in C. And um, from the point from this sort of diagrammatic picture of functions, that's um, that's what composition means. Of course, we had a fancier definition of, of functions as, as relations, as ordered pairs um, in Cartesian product of, of two sets. And it takes a little bit of thought to think of, uh, to get a, uh, a definition of composition in this setting. Um, and so here's how it works. So in this fancy language, F and G are subsets of the Cartesian product of A and B and B and C respectively. And so they're sets of ordered pairs and there's a condition which makes it a function. Uh, the condition being that uh, for every element of the domain, there's a unique element of the codomain such that the corresponding ordered pair is in the function. So how do you figure out what the ordered pairs for G composed with F are? Well, they have to sit in A cross C. So their pairs, G, cross, Z, G composed with F is a collection of pairs of the form AC where A is in A and C is in C. And how do we know which pairs you include? Well, you have to be able to get from A to C by way of an element in B. So this is B here. This is A. And here's C. So in order, in order for the ordered pair AC to belong to the composition of these functions, there has to be a point B, little b, in, in the middle, and an arrow that goes from little a to little b, and then from little b to little c. So it's the, com it's the set of pairs AC, where a is in a and c is in c, such that there is a b, in B with AB in F 
and BC in G. So this is a nice example of a use of an existence quantifier. The way to tell if a pair AC is in the function G is if there is, exists a B and B, which gives you this bridge point. Takes, you can get from A to B and then from B to C. There may be uh, multiple... Um, how many Bs could there be? Well, there, if, if A, B is an F, there can only be one B because um, that's what makes this a function. It's that for each A and A, there's a unique B. So we have to find uh, this unique bridge that gets us from A to C. And that defines the composition of functions. Now, the way I've described this, um, I've had, if you look back at the original definition, I have the codomain of F and the domain of G being exactly the same. And strictly speaking, that isn't required. Uh, there's a couple of variations. All we really need is for the codomain of F and the domain of G to have a relationship that, that the codomain of F is a subset of the domain of C because then it, it will still enable us to define the composition G composed with F of X as G of F of X, because when we apply F to an element of A, we get an element of B. And if B is an element of C, then we can apply G to that F of X. So the, the, uh, the definition of composition still makes sense. And so strictly speaking, B and C can be different. Uh, the, the codomain of F and the domain of G can be different as long as one is a subset of the other. And in fact, all we really need is that the range of F, which is a subset of B, has to be a su subset of C. Uh, because again, we know that the only elements of B that get hit by F from A, is that's the definition of the range of F. And so no matter what A we pick, we're only going to get Bs in the range. And as long as the range is a subset of C, we can evaluate G on those elements and make sense out of the composition. So these are slight variations which give us a little bit of a generalization of the notion of um, function. I'm not going to worry about these too much, um, but um, it's something to bear in mind. Now, it's always good to keep the following warning in mind when you're working with composition of functions because it's possible to get quite confused, at least for me. When we write the composition of G and F, this means first apply the function F, then apply the function G. Even though there's a lot of instincts that we have, at least if we come from uh, a language, our native language is one that goes from left to right, to read this as first G and then F. And that is not right. First you do F, then you do G, even though it's written in this funny way. So the, the order is from the inside out. Okay, let's look at a couple of examples to see if we can make this uh, a little clearer. So here's a very simple example, which is problem one from the section 12.4. So we have the set A, which consists of five, six, and eight. So I'm going to use this representation. Here's A. And I'm going to use, here's the set B, which has zero and one. And here's the set C, which has one, whoops, one, two, and three in it. And we're given the function f uh, in the form of ordered pairs. So f contains 5, 1. So I'm going to draw an arrow from 5 to 1. 6, 0. So I'm going to draw an arrow from 6 to 0. And 8, 1. So I'm going to draw an arrow from 8 to 1. And g consists of the pairs 0, 1 and 1, 1. And the problem is to find the composition G composed with F. So remember the, the, from the, um, there's two ways to think about this, probably more than two ways. One way that maybe the easiest is to say, remember that the composition means first F, 
then G. So let's write down the ordered pairs. What are the possible starting points? Whoops. First F, then G means is G composed with F? Well, we start with five. Five goes to one, which goes to one. We start with six. Six goes to zero, goes to one. And then we have eight. And eight goes to one, which goes to one. So if you remember, the, the ordered pair sort of definition was that a, a, a pair belongs to the, the composition if there's a midpoint that allows you to get from one to the other. So for instance, how do we know that five, three is not in G composed with F? Well, the condition would be there would have to be a point in B so that you could get from five to B. There would have to, so if five, three were in G composed with F, that would imply that there exists a B in B with 5B in F and B3 in G. But if we look at this, there's no, nothing hits 3. There is no B here so that B3 is in G. And so this is false. And so therefore, 5, 3 is not in G composed with F. But the most straightforward way to do it is just to follow the arrows, uh, at least in these finite cases, and you notice that everything gets sent to one in the composition. Five goes to one, six goes to one, and eight goes to one, although by different paths. Okay, um, here's another problem. This is problem three from the same section. Um, here we have a function uh, from A to, uh, function from a set A to itself, uh, two functions actually from a set A to itself, the functions are F and G. And because F goes from A to A and G goes from A to A, because of this, because these match up both ways, it makes sense to look at G composed with F and f composed with g. And to compare these, maybe a composition of functions is a commutative operation under some circumstances. So let's draw the picture here. So here's a, and here's a again. One, two, three, one, two, three. And let's use um, red for f. This is gonna be f. So f has one goes to two, 2 goes to 2, and 3 goes to 1. And let's use blue for G. Um, and we're going to draw the arrows for G in the opposite direction. So uh, 1 goes to 3, 2 goes to 1, 3 goes to 2. So now let's look first at F composed with G. Um, uh, sorry, let's look first at G composed with F, which means first F, then G. So remember, the, the red arrows are F. So 1 goes to 2 by F, and 2 goes to 1 by G. So G composed with F, 1 ends up going back to 1. What about 2? Well, 2 goes to 2 by the red arrow from F, and 2 goes back to 1 by the blue arrow from G, so 2 goes to 1. And what about 3? 3 goes to 1 by the red arrow, and then back to 3 by the blue arrow, so 3 goes to 3. Next, let's compute F circle G, first G, then F. So if we start at 1 for G, first we do the blue arrow to 3, and then the red arrow to 1, 
So we just get back to one. If we start at two, the blue arrow takes us to one and the red arrow takes us back to two. So we have two, two. And the blue arrow takes us to two and the red arrow then takes us back to two. So three goes to two. And you'll notice that these functions are different from each other. When you do G composed with F, two goes to one. When you do F composed with G, two goes to two. For the two functions to be equal, these sets would have to be the same, and they're not. So this is an example that, in general, composition of functions isn't commutative. The order matters. Even in situations where both F composed with G and G composed with F make sense, they don't have to be the same. And let's do one more. This one involves um, formulas. I seem to have a lot of typos in these slides. This should be F is a function from Z cross Z to Z. And g is a function from z to z cross z. So let's look at g composed with f first of all. So f goes from z cross z to z, and g goes from z to z cross z. So this is going to be a function from z cross z to z cross z. On the other hand, f composed with g, first you do g, which takes you from z to z cross z. And then you do f, which takes you from z cross z to z. So it's going to be a function from z to z. So g composed with f means we have to plug in an element of z cross z, mn. And by definition, this is g of f of mn. Well, f of mn is m plus n. So g of m plus n is the pair m plus n, m plus n. So the composition of functions g composed with f of mn is the ordered pair m plus n, m plus n. Now the other way around, if we take f composed with g of m, because it's just a function from z to z, by definition, this is f of g of m, which is f of m, m, because g of m is m, m. And that's m plus m, which is 2m. So f composed with g of m is just 2m. Now, we already remarked that the composition of functions isn't commutative, but it is associative in the sense that if you have three functions, so here's A goes by F to B, goes by G to C, goes by H to D. If you first, if you start at A and go to C and then go to H by first using the composition of F and G and then adding H, or you first do the composition of G and H to get from B to D and then do F, you get the same answer either way. And remember that to, to verify this, um, we want to know that the ordered pairs that make up these two functions are the same. And they're both, this. I mean, H composed with G composed with F. H composed with G means first do G and then do H. So this is a function from B to D, and this is a function from A to B. So the composition is going to be a function from A to D. So this should be a subset of A cross D. And similarly, H composed with G composed with F. First you do F, that gets you to B, and then you do G. So this is a function from A to C. And then this is a function from C to D. So together it's a function from A to D. 
So they're both subsets of A cross D. So they at least have a chance of being equal to each other. And all we really need to do to see that they're equal is to look and the ordered pairs that you have in here are A, and then you have, first you take F of A, and then you take H composed with G of F of A. Let's do it. Let's use the other notation. So let's check. What is H composed with G composed with F of A? Well, it's H composed with G of F of A, which is, remember, H composed with G of something means first do G, and then do H. And if you do it the other way, well, G composed with F of A means first do G of F of A, well, maybe I'll write it out just to be completely pedantic. It's H of G composed with F of A. But that's by definition H of G of F of A. So these are equal to one another. In other words, the ordered pairs consist of A H of G of F of A <laughs> in both cases. And so these functions are equal to one another. Really, to check that two functions are equal, it's enough to show that they take the same values on the same points. And that's what we've done here. To finish up this section, um, the last thing to check is to see how um, how this works with injectivity and surjectivity. And um, the basic point we're going to show is that if both functions are injective, then the composition is injective. And if both functions are surjective, then the composition is surjective. And this is a good chance to practice both with composition and with injectivity and surjectivity. So first, let's suppose, let's do this one first. Suppose f and g are injective functions. So we will show that g composed with f is injective. And we're going to use the contrapositive notion. We're going to suppose g composed with f of x equals g composed with f of y. Then we will show that x equals y. And this is one of the formulations of injectivity. You can either formulate it as if x and y are different, then f of x and f of y are different. Or you can formulate it in the contrapositive form that if x and y, f of x and f of y are the same, then x and y are the same. And that's the method we're going to use here. So if g composed with f of x is by definition g of f of x, and g composed with f of y is g of f of y. And um, our, assum our assumption is that these are equal. So in other words, that tells us that g of f of x is g of f of y. But g is injective. So if g is injective, that means that if g of something equals g of something else, then those two things have to be equal. But f is injective, so therefore x equals y. So we were able to unwind the uh, injectivity one step at a time. 
and we assumed that g composed with f of x was g composed with f of y, and we got, as a result, x equals y. So therefore, g composed with f is injective. What about surjectivity? So suppose g and f are surjective. We will show that g of f of, well, or let me write it in the fancy way, g circle f of x, uh, g circle f is also surjective. So to do that, we have to show that we have to choose. So remember that to go back here, f goes from a to b and b goes from g to c. So g composed with f is a function from a to c. And to prove it's surjective, we have to choose a c in c. And we have to prove we must find a in a so that g composed with f of a, which by definition is g of f of a, uh, is equal to c. And the strategy for this is going to be to, um, like before, unwind this one step at a time. Um, we must find an a so that g composed with f I don't want all this. I just want C. I need to find an A so the G composed with F of A is equal to C. Now, to do this a step at a time, since G is surjective, there is a B in B so that G of A Sorry, that f, the g of b is equal to c. So here's my picture. Here's a goes to b goes to c. And I've got my point in c. And I start by finding a point in b for which g takes me to c. And I can do that because since g is surjective, I can always find a point here that will get me to any point over there. Now... Since f is surjective, there is an a in a so that f of a equals b. In other words, since f is surjective, I found this b here. I know that there's an a in a that I can get to by f so that I can get to that b. And then if we put these two things together, we see that um, if we first do, uh, if we do G composed with F of A, that's G of F of A, which is G of B, which is C. So I found, I showed there has to be an A, which goes by G composed with F to C. And therefore I showed that G composed with F is surjective.